Welcome to Mormon Kabbalah 101. My name is David Fairman. I'm the first elder of the Church of Jesus Christ in Christian Fellowship. I was called to this ministry nearly four years ago, and I've been teaching Mormon Kabbalah for about a year and a half now. Today we're going to be talking about the nature of God and Kabbalah. Let's start off with an opening prayer. Elohim Shaddai, we bow our heads humbly before thee at this time. We thank thee for this opportunity to worship together and to learn together, and we ask that our spirits and our minds will be open, that we will speak spirit to spirit, and that the things that we learn will allow us to see thee in a greater light and appreciate the diversity of views and ideas that many in this world have of thee and to accept one another where we are. Bless us that we will be able to grow in our understanding of thee and also in our understanding of thy creation, of our fellow beings, that rather than telling people how one should believe or worship thee, we will instead open our minds and our hearts to true worship and respect the differences that we have one with another in our understanding of who you are, that we may meet others where they are in the just as you met us. Open our minds, open our hearts, open our spirits. These things we pray in the name of thy beloved Son, even Jesus Christ. So mote it be. Amen. The Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost is one God, infinite and eternal, without end. Amen. Doctrine of the Saints 2.27 Everyone that reads this scripture is going to interpret it differently. There is a wide variety of ideas in the world, in Christianity, and in the Latter-day Saint movement as to the nature of God. It's easy to read this and say, well, this, yeah, this, this expresses exactly what I believe God is. We need to open our hearts as we go through this lesson today and recognize that it also perfectly describes how others view the Lord, even though it is different from the way you or I may view the Lord. So with that, let's talk about the nature of God. We're going to stick to the Latter-day Saint or Mormon movement. And with a hundred different denominations within that movement, there's obviously going to be a widely differing range of views of the nature of God. So what we're going to try to do here is kind of go over the variety by going over the evolution in the original church of Jesus Christ that Joseph Smith set up. And in that church, it, it, the way it started was they, they used the concept of the Trinity. Now, the Trinity is one of those ideas that's easy to explain, but hard to understand. The general idea of this teaching is that the Father is the Son, is the Holy Spirit. Yet at the same time, the Father is not the Son and is not the Holy Spirit. The idea is that we as finite beings cannot understand this. Uh, we, we can say it. We can express it, but it's it's a mystery. And because of our finite nature, we, we can't understand. Now, today, there are Latter-day Saint denominations that do hold this Catholic idea of the Trinity. Uh, Community of Christ, which is the second largest Latter-day Saint denomination, and many of its offshoots, they worship the Trinity. They're Trinitarians, and, and there are others. By the time they reached Kirtland, the early saints, the idea of God had changed. Keep in mind, in Joseph Smith's first vision, he saw the Father and the Son, and he obviously was filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's, that's according to Joseph Smith's own word. There are several different versions of the first vision, but the one that's written in Joseph Smith's hand states that he saw two beings. So by 1835, the Church of God, which was formerly the Church of Latter-day Saints and formerly the Church of Christ, accepts this new scripture into their canon. It's called the Doctrine and Covenants. The doctrine portion of this book of scripture is more commonly known today as the Lectures on Faith. So now at this point, this new scripture allows them to move past Trinitarianism to teach something that, that better reflects what Joseph Smith saw in his first vision experience. So in the Lectures on Faith, it says there are two personages 
who constitute the great matchless governing and supreme power over all things. They are the Father and the Son, the Father being a personage of spirit, glory, and power, possessing all perfection and fullness, the Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, a personage of tabernacle, made or fashioned like unto a man. So according to this scripture, God the Father and Son are of one mind, and this is how they create the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Ghost, through the, through the unity of their minds. Uh, moving on there in, in Lecture 7, it says, Jesus possessing the same mind with the Father, which mind is the Holy Spirit that bears record of the Father and Son. And these three constitute the Godhead and are one. Now keep in mind, the Latter-day Saint movement is part of the Protestant Restorational movement. Obviously, it's something more than that because unlike the Baptists and Jehovah's Witnesses and the Seventh-day Adventists and others in this, in this group of Protestant churches, um, Protestant denominations, we actually have additional scripture, additional canon. So we kind of became a movement offshooting from that movement. But the idea of the movement was to go back to the book of Acts and try to recreate the original church and Sidney Rigdon, who was a Campbellite, was was big on that because the Campbellites were, were part of this movement. And this reflects better what Sidney Rigdon and, and Joseph Smith understood from the scriptures and not just the first vision, because they were looking in Acts 755, which says he being filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking of Stephen, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. There has to be two separate beings, even if they're somehow one. So how do you unify them? And the way that they decided to unify them was this idea that the Holy Ghost, the third personage, was the combination of the two. Now, when you're reading through this in a way, these are all still one God. And to the Trinitarian, this can easily appear to be some sort of attempt to, to explain the Trinity. However, it's pretty clear here that now we do have two gods, a Father God, who's a spirit, and that's important to remember at this point, and a God, the Son, with a physical body. And there are still Latter-day Saint denominations today that believe in this idea of two gods, the Church of Jesus Christ being one of them. However, as time moved on, the nature of God has expanded again. You notice the word there in Lecture 7, the Godhead. Well, the Godhead today in Latter-day Saint traditions, more typically refers to the idea of three separate gods, sometimes four. And this comes from the Utah Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints Doctrine and Covenants 130.22. The Father has a body of bones as tangible as man's, the Son also. But the Holy Ghost has not a body of flesh and bones, but is a personage of spirit. Were it not so, the Holy Ghost could not dwell in us. Now this is a few years before Joseph Smith's death in 1844. So now officially, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit are at least three personages. And we notice now that the Father is no longer a being merely of spirit, but of spirit and body. In addition to this, there's also a teaching from Joseph Smith that there's a fourth deity, a heavenly mother, or the Queen of Heaven, mentioned in the Bible in the hymns of the original church. She being the wife, the divine feminine, a goddess in her own right, with a perfect body of flesh and bone. Even though they've been officially promoted, denied, or in question throughout the history of the various denominations, depending on who's leading at the time, th this, these ideas are still somehow a part of Latter-day Saint canon. So, as this brief overview shows, there is a wide variety of ideas in the nature of God within our movement. Um, really, this brief overview is just a starting point. In the Church of Jesus Christ and Christian Fellowship, we do not promote one above the other. It's really all about understanding that through Christ's grace and through the Holy Spirit, God meets us where we are. And God reveals himself in a way that we can understand and relate to. As we grow closer to God, our understanding may evolve just as it did in the original church and it, as it does in these various denominations today. Everyone in each denomination is going to have their own idea of God, regardless of how close it is to what that church officially claims to believe. So because of this, in our Articles of Faith, it says, We believe in God, the Eternal Father and Mother, and the Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost. What that means 
will differ from person to person, and that's okay. But I want to go deeper into this idea of divine masculine and feminine, the yod hey. Now, it doesn't really matter here if we're talking about a Trinitarian view where everyone's one, or a Godhead view where they're separate beings. That's irrelevant. There's a two-letter name of God, Yah. Yah is two Hebrew letters, Yod and He. There's a misunderstanding that this is a short or abbreviated version of Yahweh, Y-H-V-H, more commonly Jehovah. However, this name for God is actually this, it's a lost teaching of our divine parents, Elohim. Avenu, God the Father, and his wife, Shekinah, who's the Queen of Heaven. There's a scripture in Isaiah, if you read it in the way it's actually written, it says, Trust ye in Yahweh forever, for in Yah, Yahweh is everlasting strength. And that's Isaiah 26, 4. So in this divine masculine and feminine, Yahweh is an everlasting strength. So what is what is Yod? What is Hey? This is the masculine and the feminine. Yod means arm or hand, as in the hand of the creator, Elohim. It represents the masculine. And in this name of God, it represents the father. Yod here is the point of creation, the giver of life, he that bestows. He is the feminine goddess, the revelation. It is through the feminine that we gain wisdom and thus our free will, the freedom to choose. Now in this idea, masculine is external while feminine is internal. And this represents the duality of man. All of us have both male and female, the desire to bestow and the will to receive. We have the internal and the external self. As we walk the path of Teshuvah, we'll find balance between the two, just as our heavenly parents have perfect balance. We can only do this through Jesus Christ. By studying Yah on a personal level, we can gain a vast understanding. It's a teaching of humility. There are extremes in our culture, demanding male dominance or female submissiveness, or the reverse. And both of these are corruptions of the truth. As society, we need to find Yod. We need to find balance between the masculine and the feminine. And this is also true within our religious organizations. God calls both men and women into service. We are the body of Christ. We are the church. If we have to have balance between masculine and feminine, then by extension, the church also must have balance between masculine and feminine. So let's talk about balance. Let's talk about the masculine and feminine in the tree of life. Isaiah 33, 6 says, And Hachma and Da'at shall be the faithfulness of thy times and safeguard of salvation. The fear of Yahweh is his treasure. Now, as we look at this tree, we see on the left side, we have Da'at, at the top, that is the masculine. On the right, we have Hakma, which is the feminine. And in the middle, we have Keter, the crown. And just going at the top, you know, th these are the columns. We have the masculine, we have the feminine, and in the center, we have the balance. If you were to take this and turn them, you know, I guess on its, on its side, lay it down, imagine it's like a set of glasses. You have a right eye lens and a left eye lens. So what is the middle? What is the balance? The balance is the opening of our third eye so that we can see the spiritual world. We can see things as they truly are. Kabbalah teaches that the tree of life is implied in Genesis 1.1. Genesis 1.1 is not translated correctly. If you read the Hebrew the way that it's written, there's a word missing. So it says in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. But that's actually not a correct translation. The way it actually reads is, in the beginning, blank created Elohim and the heavens and the earth. What's this blank? The blank is God. The blank is the creator. Created Elohim, what is Elohim? Well, according to Kabbalah, Elohim here is the Sephirot on the tree of life. So let's go into the Sephirot and the four ideas of the Christian deity on this tree of life. We're going to focus on Da'at, Hakma, Hesed, and Gevura. I should start off by explaining that in Mormon Kabbalah, the tree of life is set up differently than traditional Kabbalah. 
In the traditional tree of life, the Sephirot Keter is at the top, followed by Bina, which is understanding, on the left, and Hakma, which is wisdom, on the right. Between them we have Da'at, which is knowledge. However, in Mormon Kabbalah we have Da'at on the left and Hakma on the right. Why? Because when we combine knowledge with wisdom, we gain understanding. So Bina is going to rest between these, and understanding is, is, is interchangeable with Keter. Keter is the crown. It is the part of the Sephirot that we as finite beings cannot comprehend. So therefore, Bina is the comprehension that we gain as finite beings through our relationship with God, as we are able to open our eyes. Dot on the left is the left eye. It represents the father, Avenu. And Hachma, the right eye, represents God the mother, or the divine feminine, Shekinah. These being gods, sealed for all time and eternity, are one in Bina, understanding. How do we reach that understanding? Because understanding, if you look at the tree, is right there, Bina is at that X. It really falls between Da'at, Hakma, Heset, and Givura. So it's only through the mercy and by receiving judgment and passing through that judgment that we're able to gain that understanding. We have to have these together. And these represent the cardinal directions and the elements. Together, these four form the Liahona, the director given to Lehi to guide his people into the promised land. So we have a venue, which is Da'at, which is knowledge, which is air, and the east. Christ comes from the east. Why? Because he ascended to the Father. So when he's coming back, he is going to be coming from the east because he's coming from where his father dwells. Shekinah, we have Hakma, wisdom, which is represented in the earth and represented by the north. Yahweh, we have Hesed, which is mercy, which is represented by water. Think of the waters of baptism and the west. If Christ is coming from the east, that means he's moving west. Then we have Michael, or the Holy Spirit, which is Gevera, which means judgment. We're judged by fire. Think of a kiln and a pot. If it's been made correctly, then that fire will translate it, will change the nature of it into a perfectly fired cup, pot, or whatever it is, bowl that, that is made. But if it's not, if there's any imperfections in it, then it explodes. That's the hellfire. We have to pass through that judgment as represented by South. Now, this is important because when we're reading the scriptures, we can dive deeper into the text. If we see something representing air, like a bird, for example, fly in the air, but they also touch the earth, right? It, north, South, East, West. When we see these things in the scripture, we can go a little bit deeper and see that they represent knowledge, wisdom, mercy, and judgment. This understanding opens our eyes to a deeper connection to ourselves, to God, the scriptures, and all of creation. Our eyes are opened to new understanding, and they're going to continue to open and continue to grow as we learn. And it came to pass, the Spirit said unto me, Look, and I looked and beheld a tree, and it was like unto the tree which my father had seen. And the beauty thereof was far beyond, yea, exceeding of all beauty. And the whiteness thereof did exceed the whiteness of the driven snow. And that's 1 Nephi 3, 46 REV, 11, 8 OPV. What is this fruit of the tree from Lehi's dream? It's the Sephirot. When we reach up and we partake of this delicious fruit, we are climbing the tree. And it's important when we read that vision that even though our eyes are open, we can still walk away. Remember in his dream, there are people who... They don't like that they're getting mocked and laughed at. They see and they taste this beautiful fruit and then, and then they just leave it behind. It's important that as we learn these things, we focus on God. We abandon ego and we move towards altruism. Because when our eyes are opened and we see how beautiful things are, we also see how beautiful things could be. And that potential for some is too much of a burden. And so they put the fruit down and they walk away. This is why we have to endure to the end. God purifies us. He gives us understanding. He gives us strength. But we still have to accept it. And as we do, we begin our ministry. And this brings us back to Yah, the Yad and the Hay. In the Church of Jesus Christ of Christian Fellowship, the priesthood is organized exactly like the Tree of Life. And, and I'll tell you, when the Lord revealed this to me nearly four years ago now, 
I, I didn't understand that. I didn't. I still don't fully understand, but I didn't understand why it was set up. Why do we need a male and a female separate? Why can't they just be one? It's because it's set up like the tree of life. On the left-hand side of the tree, we have the brotherhood of Christ. On the right, we have the sisterhood of Christ. And in the, down the middle, when the two come together, so that we can have that understanding, so we can work as one, we have the order of the ministry. So we were asked specifically by God to create a brotherhood to represent the masculine yod and a sisterhood to represent the feminine hey. This does not mean that one represents God the Father and the other God the Mother, or the divine masculine and the divine feminine. Both organizations represent and do the works of Christ. This is Christ's fellowship. The fellowship cannot fully organize without the yod and the hay. As above, so below. As below, so above. This is reflected in Matthew 6.10. This is why when we look at the Council of Elders within the fellowship, it will consist of nine persons. We have the first elder and elect lady representing the first presidency, male and female. We have the co-presidents of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, again, male and female. The co-presidents of the Seventy, to represent the Seventy, again, one male, one female. Or I should say, one identifying male and one identifying female. And we have a patriarch and matriarch of the fellowship, representing the high priesthood and evangelists and the various churches that associate with us. And then the ninth is a lay member of the fellowship, representing the body of Christ, the assembly of saints. So in this manner, the yod and the hay, the male and the female, are represented in all the quorums. Being nine, it's a finite balance because we are finite beings. The order of the ministry will function as God intended, utilizing men and women of God to bring souls to Christ inside and out of the fellowship, helping all to grow in Christ's grace and to help restore the divine feminine to bring balance to this world.